And has start. Yeah, I I... You start. Yeah, you can start. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Dear uh, clicker and friends, uh, dear clickers and friends, we are very glad to invite Professor Hannes Left Gable to do uh, two lectures at Wuhan University. Uh, at first, I take the honor to take the very short introduction to Professor Hannes Left Gable. He is a young man, you say, <laughs> very smart. Uh, he is younger, 50 years than me. Uh, but, uh, yeah, his title, title means uh, recognitions from the authorities and the academic uh, community. His title, Chairs of Logic and Philosophy of Language. Alexander von Humbert, professor and founder or, and co-director of the Munich Center for Mathematical Philosophy. Uh, he works at the uh, University of Munich, Germany. He gets a lot of honors. He is a member of Germany National Academy of Science, uh, member of Academia Europea, uh, member of International Academy of Philosophy of Science, or by election. Uh, he got a lot of funding and awards, a huge amount of funding. For example, the first, Alexander von Humboldt Professorship, Euro, Euro, you see? Three, five, zero, 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 zero. In Chinese, 350,000 uh, yuan. Then, the, 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 a ladder. For 45,000 euro, uh, uh, 70,000 British, British pounds, so a lot, hood, uh, and many other awards for excellence for teaching and the publications. His errors of specialization. Has uh, covered very widely logical, epistemology, philosophy of language, philosophy of science, philosophy of mathematics, metaphysics, cognitive science, errors of competence, history of logical empiricism, color, quiet. He gets Four PhDs with distinction. Mathematics, uh, 1998, and philosophy, 2001. Mm. He had been coordinating editor of Review of Symbolic Logic, the editor in chief of Accountants, and many other journals, gold journals. Uh, associate editor and the member of the board. Mm. Had publications, many, many. Uh, uh, I, I found a toy English book, The Stability, the Stability of Belief and the Influence on the Low Level. Mm. Uh, uh, many uh, distinguished uh, articles on distinguished academic journals. Mm. In 2017, I once visited the Munich Center for Mathematical Philosophy, which Professor Hannes left gave and gave a talk 
applying a logic truth over there. At that time, uh, some staff and students at Munich uh, University once talked with me that Professor Hannes that game is a genius. So let us call, listen to a genius professor uh, what <laughs> talks to us. Welcome. The time, oh yeah, uh, I have to, uh, uh, Professor Hannes Let Gable uh, gave today gave his le first lecture on merely expressive devices. He talks Latin minutes. The audience write down your question in your bo in, in the bo your box. The staff at the uh, will forward your question to me. And I read them out one by one. Then Professor Hannes let game gave his replies. Okay, now the time is Professor Hannes let game. Please, okay. Uh, I I I have to how to see. Uh, how to how to how oh yeah. How to how to how to close my <laughs> who, who can tell me how to close? How to close the sharing? Ah, uh, Chinese is the upper part. It should have the button. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yes, here, here. Okay, uh, it's your turn. Thanks so much, Simbo, for this very, very kind uh, introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure and, and honor um, to speak at uh, Wuhan University, if only virtually. And I hope and I'm sure that this will be the beginning of a lot of cooperation between our two places in, in the future. Um, I especially like the part, Chenbo, where you called me a young philosopher. <laughs> so this, this, this hasn't happened for a while, <laughs> but I, I appreciate it. Unfortunately, I don't think it's true anymore. If, if I look at the photo that you used, then I can see much more hair there. So I, I think this undermines your thought. But anyway, um, I appreciate it. <laughs> and, and many thanks also uh, to, to Young for, for, for setting things up. Um, it, it, it was great preparing this. Uh, <coughs> thanks so much uh, to both of you and, and to your colleagues. All right, let me share my screen. So I hope you can all see that fine. Yeah, 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 fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so my talk will be about um, linguistic entities of a special kind that I'm going to call merely expressive devices. Okay, so these will be linguistic items, linguistic expressions that occur in sentences such that when such a merely expressive device occurs in a sentence, it plays a role in determining the proposition that is expressed by the sentence without playing a role in determining the truth conditions of the proposition thereby expressed. Okay, so I'm going to drive a wedge in my talk between a proposition and the truth conditions of that proposition. And you might you might think, why would I do that? Um, normally, we are we are we are used to identify propositions and their truth conditions. Um, but you will see that there is a point, I hope, in in driving a wedge between them. And merely expressive devices um, will illuminate that kind of difference. So that what makes a merely expressive device merely expressive is that it merely helps us to express a proposition, and then its job is done. OK, when you then want to check whether that uh, proposition is true or false by comparing it to the world, as it were, the merely expressive device doesn't have a role anymore to play. OK, and now you might think, uh, well, are there merely expressive devices in, in, in my sense at all? And I, I want to argue yes. And the paradigm case instance that you should think of at this point will be logical operators, logical connectives, right? Like this symbol here for 
disjunction for the or. I want to argue that logical operators are merely expressive devices. So they help us to express a proposition or to grasp a thought, as it were. For example, by thinking that or saying that A or B, so we use the disjunction symbol, the logical operator, to grasp a thought. But once we've done that, okay, the, the logical operators, like the disjunction symbol, they don't have any additional role to play anymore. Okay? When the question then is whether the proposition thereby expressed, the proposition that A or B, okay, is true or false, when that proposition is compared to the world, the disjunction symbol doesn't have a role anymore to play, and that makes it a merely expressive device. Okay? So another way of putting the idea will be what the logical operator does is and it, it, it denotes a truth function. But a truth function is something purely mathematical, right? It maps truth values, say one and zero, to truth values. Um, it's not that an operator like a disjunction symbol refers to anything in the world, okay? Um, it, it, it's not that we need to compare a disjunction sentence, okay, to anything in the world where part of what we have to compare it to is denoted by the disjunction symbol. That's not how disjunction works semantically. And I want to argue that's not how logical operators work semantically, okay? They merely have a function um, that is to structure thought, okay? But once that is done, they don't have any additional function, sort of, they don't reach into the world, into the material, as it were, okay? They are purely structural. And that's what I have in mind with a merely expressive device. And I don't want to say that this is a new idea. Um, in a sense, you find it in Wittgenstein, in, in, in the uh, Tractatus uh, Logico Philosophicus, um, when he says, mein Grundgedanke ist, dass uh, die logischen Konstanten nicht vertreten. Okay? Which means that my basic thought is that the logical constants do not represent. Okay? And that will be just a different way of saying what I say, that the logical constants are merely expressive devices. But it's not just the logical constants that are merely expressive devices, but there are other merely expressive devices, and some of which I will uh, um, uh, cover in my talk. So what I want to do in my talk is I want to rationally reconstruct such merely expressive devices in a special kind of conceptual framework. A merely expressive device in a sentence will contribute mathematical structure by which the, the, the proposition that is expressed by the sentence, which will be a set of possible worlds, okay, uh, will be determined. So the merely expressive devices contribute structure by which we can determine the proposition that is expressed by a sentence that includes that merely expressive device. Okay? But then its function is done. Once um, um, we have determined the proposition that is expressed by A, uh, when we then have uh, to determine whether that proposition is true or false, okay, and this is done by comparing it, as it were, to an intended interpretation, then the merely expressive device doesn't have a role to play anymore. Um, by a proposition, okay, I will mean in my talk a set of possible worlds, like in standard intentional semantics, but note that these um, um, possible worlds, they will be purely mathematical entities in my reconstruction. And what set of mathematical entities such a proposition will be, that will be partly determined by the mathematical structure that the merely expressive device uh, contributes, okay? The merely expressive device that occurs in, in, in the sentence A in question. So in the case of disjunction, you start with a sentence that includes the disjunction symbol, okay? Then the semantics in that framework will determine uh, a set of possible worlds, the proposition expressed, uh, by the sentence A, but these possible worlds will be purely mathematical, okay? So this whole box here will be a purely mathematical part of what I'm going to call a conceptual framework. And then in order to determine whether that set of mathematical possible worlds is true or false, we will compare it to an intended interpretation of the language in question, okay? Um, uh, and once this is done, we will see whether there is an actual world, okay? one that sort of matches the structure of, of, of the world out there, whether there is an actual world in this set of possible worlds, and that will help us to determine the truth value of the proposition. But the disjunction symbol, the mathematical structure it contributes, will not have a role anymore to play in that final comparison. Okay? Now, the idea is 
the conceptual framework consists of a purely mathematical part and of what I call a label or an intended interpretation, which you can think of as, as giving you a kind of empirical interpretation of the language in question. And if you put the two things together, the purely mathematical part and the in intended interpretation, the empirical label, then you get what I call um, a conceptual framework. Okay, so that's the idea. Uh, roughly, the terminology of label comes from the idea that this is like graph theory, okay? So in graph theory, we like to study unlabeled graphs purely mathematical structures with nodes and edges, and they would live in the box in this purely mathematical part of the framework. But then we sometimes in graph theory also like to label the nodes and the edges of an unlabeled graph with something in the world, right? So the nodes might represent people and the edges might represent, um, you know, the acquaintance relation of people. So this will then be a label, an empirical interpretation that we attach to the purely mathematical structure. And it's the same idea that I have an operation here when I want to um, deal with my conceptual frameworks, okay? Now I will work out the details of such an intentional conceptual framework semantics for merely expressive devices in my talk. And then at the end, I want to draw some general philosophical conclusions from it. I won't give you an explicit definition of the term conceptual framework, um, but I will give you examples, paradigmatic representative examples, okay? If you wanted, I could give you a fairly general definition, but um, it's, not, it's not important for my talk. So this is a little bit like Alfred Tarski uh, dealing with formal theories of truth, okay? So basically he worked out definitions of truth for particular uh, representative paradigmatic object languages, and, you know, this was good enough for his purposes because thereby people could see how to extend the same idea um, um, of defining truth for other object languages. And I will do the same once I've given you some conceptual framework, you will get the idea of how to generalize and build conceptual framework for other application cases that you might be interested in. Okay, the first example will be for the logical constants, for the logical operators, and they will turn out to be merely expressive devices in the conceptual frameworks that I'm going to build. And then my second example will be uh, stipulatively defined terms, stipulatively defined terms. I want to argue that they are also merely expressive devices, and that will be my second uh, example. And the third one, I think, will be the philosophically most interesting one. I want to argue that you can build conceptual frameworks in which operators for metaphysical necessity, operators that you would typically find in metaphysics, okay, uh, will turn out to be uh, merely expressive devices as well. Okay, so at the end of my talk, you will have seen three examples of merely expressive devices, logical operators, stipulatively defined terms, and the metaphysical necessity operator, okay? And at the end, I'll draw some conclusions and you will see um, that there are in fact many further examples of merely expressive devices around. And what's ultimately behind my talk today is a bigger project. Um, um, uh, Chen Bo uh, and I just talked a bit about this before my, my talk begin, began. Um, um, I'm just writing a book um, which will be called Reviving Logical Empiricism. So I want to show that there is a version, an updated, enlightened version of logical empiricism that can be saved from the famous criticisms of logical empiricism. And what I'm going to present today is part of that project. Okay? So as you will see, I hope at the end of my talk, some of the tenets of Rudolf Carnap's logical empiricism can be vindicated to the extent, at least, to which they were dealing with merely expressive devices, okay? I'm not saying I can save all of traditional uh, logical empiricism, okay? Something was wrong about it, and I want to repair what was wrong about it. For example, traditional logical empiricism tried to abandon, to reject metaphysics. This is not part of my project, okay? My enlightened logical empiricism will be happy to embrace uh, metaphysics, and this third example here will give you a hint of how I'm going to do that, okay? So that's the broader picture. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, people these days think logical empiricism was a big failure. You can't save it. OK, so, um, you know, don't tell anyone that I'm trying to revive logical empiricism. Let's keep it as a secret be be between us. OK, for the time being, until my book is ready uh, to defend the whole project. All right. Let us build a conceptual framework. So I'm, I'm going to start now with my, my first example. And as I said, um, uh, the conceptual framework consists of two parts. The first one is purely mathematical, 
And that's the part that I'm going to start with. So let's build a set of worlds, okay? Let W be a set of worlds. I will define W to be the set of all triples, okay? Uh, of this sort, D, M1, and M2, where D is a finite, non-empty, initial segment of the natural numbers, and M1 and M2 are subsets of D. That's it. Take all the triples of that sort, collect them in a set, call that set W, that's the set of possible worlds in my first conceptual framework. So, you know, nothing has happened so far. This is a purely mathematical definition, and these possible worlds are purely mathematical entities, okay? So, for example, one of these D sets could be the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, okay? This is a little non-empty initial uh, segment of the natural numbers, and M1 could be a subset like the set 1, 2, 3, and M2 could be a subset like the set 1, 4, 7. So, if you put them together as a triple, that's one of my possible worlds. But now you run through all the combinatorial possibilities okay, for these sets D, M1, and M2, you put them into your set W, that's my set of possible worlds now, okay, that's the first part. So now we have an infinite set of possible worlds, and now I add this label structure, what will be the intended interpretation of the language that we are going to interpret in our conceptual framework. Or a different way of putting it is, if you have thoughts, propositions, in the conceptual framework, that I'm currently building, then these thoughts will be about that label structure. So let's, let's assume we want to think about humans, okay, whether a human is a man or not, okay, and whether one of these humans is married or not. Okay, so this is just a little trivial example, that's all, okay? So I put these things into the label structure. Uh, the label is again a triple. The first ingredient is the set of humans at a point of time, the set ingredient, uh, the, set, the second ingredient is the set of men at that point of time. And the third ingredient is the set of married people at that point of time. Okay. Um, now, if you had thought about something else, so you don't want to just think about humans, but about all physical objects at a point of time, then you would put the set of all physical objects where I use the set of humans here. Okay. You, you get the idea. Yeah. Um, now, put the two things together, the set W of possible worlds, purely mathematical, and the label structure, the intended interpretation, put the two together, then you get my first conceptual framework, which I'm calling F. So it's this pair of F and, uh, and, and the label structure, and that's my, my first conceptual framework. Okay? Now, the second point is, um, I want to define some of these possible worlds in such a framework to be actual. Okay, sort of to get the uh, intended interpretation or the intended label structure right. Okay, and the idea will be an idea that's familiar from uh, parts of the philosophy of science. Um, I will call one of these possible worlds actual in the framework, just in case there is a function L, call it labeling as it were, right, from the domain of the world. So that's the first ingredient here, the D, to the set of humans that was the first component of the label structure, such that this function L is structure preserving. It's an isomorphism, okay? So it's bijective and it gets the structure right, okay? What does that mean? In our case, this means if you look uh, at all the objects little m in the domain, then m is in m1, the first, uh, the second component of the triple, just in case the label is in the set of main that was the the second component of the label structure. And if you look at all M in D, M is in the third component, M2, just in case its label, right, which uh, will be a human, okay, is in the set of married people in the label structure, okay? So in other words, a word is actual, the world being a purely mathematical entity, if it gets the structure of the label structure exactly right, if there is a bijective structure-preserving map between the two of them, an isomorphism, okay? Now, it's easy to see, and I'll return to that on the next slide, that in general, in a framework, there can be more than one actual world. And in our case here, with my little example, you will see very soon that there is, in fact, more than one actual world. But all the actual worlds will be pairwise isomorphic. So with respect to structure, it, it, it doesn't really matter. They're indistinguishable, as it were. Okay? Now, what I'm going to call a proposition is what you would call a proposition in intentional semantics, namely a set of worlds. More precisely, although this won't be so important in my talk today, I will really call a set of possible worlds and a proposition if that set of possible worlds is closed under isomorphisms, closed under this bijective structure-preserving maps. 
Okay, but you know, forget about it. propositions are sets of worlds in a framework. Okay, so this idea here is familiar from intentional semantics, but also from measurement theory, where you have a similar idea that sort of the proposition, what is empirically significant, is what is preserved under certain structure preserving maps. So I mentioned this because my conceptual framework really take up ideas that you find in the literature, in logic and in semantics and the philosophy of science and philosophy of mathematics. And I put them together and I use them in, 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 in this theory of conceptual frameworks, okay? And similarly, I will call a proposition true in a framework just in case the proposition includes a, a world that is actual in the framework. So again, that's an idea that you get in intentional semantics, but it's also an idea that you find in, in philosophy of science, right? So in part of the literature and philosophy of science, theories are reconstructed as sets of models or structures. That's the so-called non-statement view of theories, okay? So a scientific theory is a set of models or structures, and then people would say it's adequate, maybe empirically adequate, if it gets the data right. And to get the data right is to say that there is a certain kind of structure-preserving map between you know, one, one world or one model in, in that set of possible worlds that is the theory and the phenomena out there. And it's the same idea here. I call a proposition, a set of worlds actual, uh, uh, true, if it includes an actual world, and that's one of these worlds that I, um, that I defined here. Okay, so that's the idea. So now we have a notion of actuality, of proposition, and of truth for propositions. So as you can see, I define truth for propositions directly. Um, I will very soon define truth for sentences based on the propositions that these sentences express. So um, truth values, okay, its, uh, uh, its bearers are primarily uh, propositions, not the sentences, okay? So I go with the older philosophical tradition where truth is uh, naturally thought to be a property of propositions, okay? And then truth for, for sentences is sort of secondary. It's not the Tarskian route where you would define truth for sentences directly. Okay, I start with the propositions. So here's a little example. So say we are very early at a point of time. Okay, so this is hypothetical. Okay, there are just two people around, Adam and Eve. And the set of men there is Adam. Okay, Eve is not a man. And the set of married people, that's the set of Adam and Eve. So married is here like a property. Okay, it's unary. It's not someone is married to someone. But it's just a question of whether someone is married at all. So let's assume at this point of time, Adam and Eve, they were a, a, a married couple. Okay, Historically, surely not right, but you, you get the idea. I want to keep things simple. So Adam is in the set of married people and Eve. That's my labeling structure. That's my labeling structure. Okay, And then we have our possible worlds. They were purely mathematical. And then it's easy to see that this is an actual world here. Okay, So it gets the cardinality of the set of humans right, one and two. And there is this labeling function that would make one represent Adam and two represent Eve. And then it gets the structure of the labeling uh, right. Okay, so the singleton set of one, that's like the singleton set of Adam. And one, two, that's like this set Adam and Eve. So this world gets the structure of the labeling of the intended interpretation right, hence it's actual. This world is also actual. It's just that two now is the representative of Adam and one is the representative of Eve doesn't really matter, W1 and W2, they are isomorphic and both are actual. But W3 here, this world is not an actual world. It doesn't get the structure of the, of the empirical label right, okay? So for example, it would think that Eve um, is not married, which is wrong, okay? And W4, which is isomorphic to W3, is not actual either, okay? Now, if you put W1 and W2 together, you get a proposition, it's a set of possible worlds, and it's a proposition that is true, because it includes an actual world. While the proposition W3, W4 is not true because it does not include an actual world, okay? And then you can build bigger propositions. Let, let's look at the set of all worlds, the set of all triples D, X, Y, such that X is a non-empty set. Then I, I want to say this is a true proposition. Why? Because it includes an actual world, right? For example, W1, because this component here indeed is non-empty. So W1 is a member of that set. And that means that set of possible worlds, that proposition is true in the framework. And if you take all worlds together, you look at the whole set W of all possible worlds in the framework, then that set is true in the framework as well because it includes an actual world, okay? But here's now an important uh, insight I want to say, okay? If you look at the set of all possible worlds whatsoever in the framework, 
then if by, by taking all mathematical structures that are in there, all possible worlds, the framework or that set of possible worlds does not actually constrain the labeling. Okay, it does not impose any constraint on, you know, the labeling that we are currently contemplating, that our thoughts are about. Okay, why? Because when we build these mathematical um, possible worlds in the framework, we've run through all combinatorial possibilities. Okay, well, there's a little proviso. I have assumed that the domain of a world, the first component is finite and non-empty. So that's basically the constraints that we project onto the world. Okay, but give me that. Okay, so finiteness is not too bad because we want to deal with humans here. Okay, and if you were it, okay, then I could beef up my example a little bit and uh, just throw in more mathematical possibilities up to some cardinality in the set theoretic hierarchy. Okay, up to the point where you would say, okay, Hannes, you're you're just presupposing that the physical objects or humans or whatever that are out there, you know. They have a cardinality that's below that big uh, uh, um, set theoretic infinite cardinal. That's good, fine. I'll give you that, okay? So cardinality shouldn't be much of an issue. And the non-emptiness of the domain, that's like in classical logic, where we're assuming that the domain, the universe of discourse of a classical model is non-empty. If you wanted to get rid of that presupposition, basically rerun my example, okay? But ultimately, you won't end up with classical logic, but with free logic, okay? With a version of free logic where you do not assume that the universe of discourse is non-empty. I could do that, okay? It would just be another conceptual framework, slightly more complex, not much would change, and then I would also solve that problem, okay? So these little constraints that I impose, they are mainly for simplicity, and there's not much to them. Okay, and once you give me that, we've run through all the combinatorial possibilities. Okay, I'm not assuming that there are four humans. Okay, I run through all the possibilities. I'm not assuming, you know, a particular set is men or a particular set is married people. I run through all the combinatorial possibilities. Okay, so therefore, that's my point. Ultimately, by mathematics alone, and of course, by the way I defined the framework, the set W is true in the framework. Okay. The set capital W must be true. There must be an actual world in the framework because whatever structure the labeling, the world out there uh, has, I've run in my framework through all the combinatorial possibilities anyway. So one of these possibilities is guaranteed to track the structure of the labeling. Okay. So by math alone and by what uh, the way I define the framework, there must be an actual world in the framework. And this contrasts with this proposition here. So W1, W2 is also true in the framework, but this is not by math alone, okay? This is not by math alone plus the definition of the framework. It's in virtue of the facts, okay? Because W1 and also W2, they get the structure right, okay? And it could have been otherwise. If there had been three people, W1 wouldn't be actual, okay? If the set of men had been different, W1 would be actual, wouldn't be actual, okay? So... This set of worlds, okay, is true, but not in virtue of the framework and mathematics alone, whereas the set of all possible worlds, that is true just in virtue of mathematics and the way I define the framework. And that's an important difference. Keep that in mind. Okay. Now, the fa final part is I now add a language. Okay. In our case, I keep it very simple. It will be a first order language with two unary predicates, the predicate for being a man and the predicate for being married such that at any possible world, D, M1, M2, D will be used as the range of the quantifiers at the world, the interpretation of the predicate man at the world will be M1, okay? and the interpretation of the predicate married at the world will be M2. So it's a sort of obvious interpretation at a world for this first order language that, that you uh, would now have thought of anyway. Okay? So we interpret our predicates by means of the components in the world, and we use the first component as the range of the quantifiers for all x, and there is an x and the like uh, in the language. And then we can define for all sentences in our first order language in the usual way, um, under which condition a sentence is true at a world in a framework, just by using the standard semantic rules. Okay? For the atomic formulas, we look at the interpretation that I've just sketched here, and for the complex formulas, right, we use the standard semantic rules. So not A will be true at a world, just in case A will be false at the world, and so on and so forth. And then we'll define that a sentence A in the language expresses a proposition, a set of worlds, just in case 
the set of worlds is precisely the set of worlds W at which the sentence A is true in the sense justified. Okay, so collect all the worlds at which the sentence is true. This will give you the proposition that is expressed by the sentence in the framework. And then we can define a sentence to be true in the framework, not true at a world, but true simpliciter, as it were, okay, in the framework, just true, true in the framework, just in case if the proposition it expresses is true in the framework, and that we've already defined that was in terms of actuality, you know, structure preservation and the like, the thing that I had on the previous slides. So we've now defined truth for sentences based on truth for propositions, as I advertised beforehand. Okay, so in the Adam and Eve example, in my little toy example, there is an X such that X is a man will be true in the framework, right? Because, you know, Adam is, is in there, okay? And this, the, the set of worlds, the proposition that is expressed by the framework will be a particular uh, 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 proposition, okay? One of these propositions that I dealt with before, it's a true proposition, and it's a proposition that is distinct from the set of all possible worlds. On the other hand, if you look at there is a man or there isn't a man, an instance of the excluded middle, this is true at every world in the framework. And the proposition it expresses is therefore the set of all possible worlds, the set W, okay, which is also true in the framework as determined before, but it is true just in virtue of, you know, the mathematics and the way we defined the framework, as I've explained before, okay? So now we can see what's going on here. Let's look at, you know, man, okay? So in the framework, the M1 coordinate of a world, this was the second component, right? D, M1, M2. This M1 coordinate of a world is meant to represent the set of main, right? The, its label, which figures in the truth conditions for propositions. When we define truth for propositions, we use the definition of actuality, and in the definition of actuality, we map the M1 component to the set of man, right? It's label, okay? So that, this is what happened. Now, if you introduce the notion of a concept, as we do in intentional semantics, so a concept is basically a function from possible worlds to extensions, okay? We can also say that in the framework that we've just built, the concept of being a man is meant to represent the set of man, its label, which figures in the truth conditions for propositions. So this is just something that was the case, as you've seen in the framework. And once we've added the language, this first of the language that I had on the previous slides, we can also say, in the framework, the predicate man, the unary predicate man, expresses the concept of being a man, which represents the set of man, its label, which again figures in the truth condition for propositions. So that is, in the framework that we've built, the predicate man has two functions, two roles to play, to play. One is, it contributes to the expressing of propositions. And secondly, via the concept it expresses, it contributes to the truth conditions for propositions. And this means, in my terminology, that the predicate man in the framework is not a merely expressive device. Okay, it helps us to grasp a thought, to grasp a proposition, but it also contributes something to this comparison that we need, the truth comparison, right? The correspondence comparison that we need to determine whether the proposition thereby expressed is true or false. It has a double role to play. Okay, that's typical of predicates. Okay, um, but what about the logical operator? Say the disjunction symbol that we also have in our first order language, right? So then note that there is no coordinate for disjunction in any world. There was just D, M1, and M2, but none of them was involved with disjunctions, okay? You can introduce the notion of a logical concept, which will again be a function from worlds to extensions, namely to truth values, okay? Once you've done that, you can say that in the framework, there is a concept of disjunction, that's fine, but it does not represent anything, any label that would figure in the truth condition for propositions, okay? Just didn't show up when we defined actuality. With the language, the first order language added, we might say that in the framework, the operator or the disjunction symbol expresses the concept of disjunction, that's fine, but that concept does not represent anything, any label that would figure in the truth condition for propositions. That is, in the framework that we've just built, the operator or has one role to play, not two. It does contribute to the expressing of proposition, so it helps us to grasp a thought 
But once it has done that, it has no further role to play. It does not contribute to the truth conditions for propositions. Okay, For the propositions, only D, M1, and M2, only the set of humans, the set of men, and the set of married people play the role. Not you know, the, the, the intention or the truth function that is determined by the operator. It does hold, for example, that the set of worlds expressed by A or B is the union of the set of worlds expressed by A and the set of worlds expressed by B. So that's true. But that's a purely mathematical relationship. It's not this, that this union function here uh, is compared to any label in the world out there, okay, when we define actuality or, or truth. That doesn't happen, okay? So this makes the or symbol a merely expressive device, okay? The upshot is, in the framework, logical concepts do not represent so that's like in the quote from Wittgenstein that I had early on in my talk. And the logical operators, these linguistic items, are merely expressive devices. You might say that they do express concepts, but they do not represent properties out there in the world. Okay? There is no disjunction property out there in the world waiting for us to be explored or discovered or the like. Okay? It's part of the mathematical uh, part of the framework, and that's it. Whereas sort of, for example, the concept of being a man or the, the, log the, the predicate man, it also reaches into the world. The logical operator does not. Now, you might say, yeah, Hannes, but that's just, you know, because you built such a crazy framework. Okay. But I want to say, no, 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 the framework is not crazy. The framework is actually a good model theoretic reconstruction of how logical operators presumably work in natural language. So there is something that we track in natural language. It's similar what we've built to natural language. It's not exactly like natural language, but there is something in natural language that we track. And the tradition, for example, the medieval tradition about logic would have expressed it in a way by saying that the logical constants are syn categorimatic. Okay? Sort of they only get their meaning in the context of other things, in the, in the context of a sentence, as it were. Okay, and that's different from predicates like being a man or being blue or something like that. Okay, so we track something right here. We just reconstructed in the framework, and uh, it's my first example of a merely expressive device. Okay, I hope this gives you a better idea now what I have in mind with a merely expressive device, and indeed the logical operators are paradigmatic examples thereof. Let me turn now to my second example. Okay. So what I do now is I take the same framework that we've just built. I will just add something to it. So the previous framework was called F. The new framework will be called F prime. It's just a little addition to the old framework. And I, I won't com comment again on the old components. By now, you have an idea. I will just comment on what I add to it. And what I will add to the previous framework I, I will put in red, so you can easily see what the change is. So for example, the set of worlds, now W prime, will be a set of quadruples. So we'll, I will have vectors of four components, as it were, not three. And the only thing that I will add is a fourth component, which I will call B. And so D, M1, and M2, as before, I run through all the combinatorial possibilities, purely mathematical, because the members of D are, again, natural numbers. Nothing has changed. But the fourth component is, again, a set of natural numbers. However, the new idea is, in this case, there will be a kind of law by which this B component is related to D and M1 and M2, and that's the law. Okay? So in each world, B will be D without M2 intersected by M1. Okay? So this here is the relative complement of M2 with respect to D. So basically everything that's in D that's not in M2, okay? And then I intersect this with this M1, okay? And this set, that's my fourth component. And in each world, you get a fourth component like that. You collect all these quadruples, and then you have your new set of possible worlds. And again, it's purely mathematical. So these quadruples are, again, purely mathematical sets of natural numbers and the like, okay? Now, you might think, okay, why is he computing B in this weird way? To give you an idea, okay, um, um, so M2, remember, was related to being married later, okay? So if you take the complement, this is like it's related to being unmarried, okay? Um, and M1 was related to being a man, okay? And the intersection is related to the conjunction. So this is a bit like saying this is to do with unmarried men, and this might now give you an idea what the B is going to stand for, 
Okay. So, you know, there are just some examples in philosophy that you have to use. Okay. We are sort of um, committed to that. Okay. Um, and I will use the standard example. Um, I hope you already have an idea of what, of what I have in mind. I, I will, I will um, um, uncover the secret very soon what the B is going to stand for. Okay. Now, I also change the label structure a little bit. Okay. I have a quadruple now. So I want to have a quadruple here. But here's the thing. In a sense, I don't put anything into my new label prime structure. And that's the point now. Ultimately, I want the B component, this fourth component, not to be labeled at all. It will not represent anything in the world. Okay. And this will be to do with this idea that B, okay, will, will help us to determine yet another merely expressive device. It will determine something that is not in the world, but purely structural. Okay. That's why this is just a mnemotechnical uh, uh, device, a reminder that the B component is not going to represent. Okay. So, you know, D will still stand for the set of humans or the set of physical entities or whatever you like. And M1 will represent the set of men. B will not represent anything. And again, put W prime and label prime together. Then you get a conceptual framework. That's the conceptual framework of my second example. And the rest goes as before. So again, we have a notion of actuality in the framework. That's again, structure preserving map. Okay. It works precisely as before. And indeed, very precisely as before, because there is no additional clause here that would map B to anything. Okay. So the structure preserving map will again get the structure right of D, M1, and M2 with respect to our labeling. B doesn't have a role to play in that definition of actuality. Okay. So no B component. And then you reformulate all the previous definitions, yeah? Truth for propositions and, and the like, and, you know, it's, it's similar as before. And once again, as in the previous framework, the framework by itself does not constrain the world, does not constrain the labeling structure. Well, there is this little proviso that I assume D to be finite and non-empty, but I've already dealt with that. Okay, and there is this law, as it were, that connects B to D and M1 and M2. But this is not a problem because B is not mapped to anything in the label structure. It's not mapped to anything in the world. It does not reach into the world. For the same reason, the B component and the way it relates to the other components in the world, that is not a constraint for label prime because B does not represent anything, right? There is, not nothing, that there is nothing about B here in structure preserving maps here. Hence, there is nothing concerning B with respect to actuality and truth for propositions and the like. Okay? If B was labeled, then we would impose a certain constraint on how the set of humans and the set of men and the set of married people relate to this fourth component and thereby how they relate to each other. Okay? And then, you know, certain ways the labeling might be uh, uh, like would be thrown out of the framework, would be excluded from the framework. And thereby, the framework would impose a constraint on what the label structure is like. But that's not the case here, right? B is not labeled. Hence, we still run through all the combinatorial possibilities with respect to the components of worlds that are labeled. And that is, whatever the label structure is, is like, one of our possible worlds must get it right structurally. And that means the set of worlds in the, in the second framework must still be true in the framework, just in virtue of mathematics and the way we set up the framework. Okay, the facts, as it were, that there is just Adam and Eve out there and so on, won't, uh, won't have a role here. Okay, so it's just like before. Now, if we introduce, um, uh, oh, sorry. So final bit, we have, to, we have to add language again. So again, we have a first order language with our previous predicates for being a man and being married unary predicates, but now we add a third unary predicate, and now the secret is, is uncovered, right? B stands for being a bachelor. So we throw in the bachelor predicate, okay? We have a third predicate, the bachelor predicate. And we interpret the predicates as before, so, you know, at the world, man is interpreted by M1 and married by M2, and bachelor by the B component. And the quantifiers range over the D, the first component at the world. Okay, and then we have all the definitions of truth, of formulas, add words, formulas or sentences expressing propositions, truth for sentences defined in virtue of truth for propositions, and so on and so forth. Okay, so for example, as before, we have that there is a man is true in the framework, the set of worlds, the proposition expressed by it is not the set of all worlds, something is excluded, 
right? Um, namely, those worlds where the set of man is empty. Um, the excluded middle, there is a man or there isn't, is true at every world in the framework. Hence, the proposition it expresses the set of all worlds in the framework, and that is true in the framework, just in virtue of mathematics and the way I defined the framework. Okay, But there's something new here in the second framework as well. If you look at this sentence here, right, for all x, x is a bachelor, just in case, if and only if, x is unmarried, not married, and x is a man, so x is a bachelor just in case x is an unmarried man, then it's easy to see that this sentence also expresses the set of all worlds in the framework, okay? Because the sentence tracks how the B component relates to the other component, right? The D and the M1 and M2 in the world, okay? This makes this sentence true in every world in the framework. Hence, the proposition expressed by it is also W prime, the set of all worlds in the framework. Okay? Hence, that sentence is true in the framework just by math alone and the definition of the framework. Okay? So this gives you a new idea. What has happened in the framework? Well, the bachelor predicate ended up to be a merely expressive device too. And the reason is we stipulatively defined it in the framework. Okay? So if we go through the components again, we can introduce the notion of a concept again as a mapping from worlds to extensions as an in intentional semantics. Then we have the concept of being a bachelor in our new framework, F prime, and that concept does not represent anything, any label that would figure in the truth condition for propositions, right? The B component was not mentioned when we defined actuality. With the language added, we can say that the predicate bachelor expresses the concept of being a bachelor, that's fine, that lives in the purely mathematical part of the framework. And that concept does not represent any label that would figure in the truth condition for propositions. So that is in the second framework F prime, the predicate bachelor has one thing to do, not two. The one thing it does is it helps us to express propositions, bachelor propositions as it were, okay? But once it has helped us to grasp these bachelor thoughts, right? Like for all X, X is a bachelor just in case, blah, blah, blah. Once it has done that, there's no further role that it has. It does not conceptually contribute to the truth conditions for the propositions thereby expressed, okay? It does hold, for example, that the proposition that is expressed, say, by there is a bachelor is the proposition that is expressed by there is an unmarried man, okay? And that um, uh, we can unpack Okay, again, according to the semantic rules that we uh, uh, have for our first order language, but it's not the case that at any world, you know, the corresponding set here, D minus M2 intersected by M1, is compared to any label in the definition of actuality or truth. Okay, so the bachelor predicate help, uh, helps us to think, helps us to grasp the proposition, but it doesn't have a role to play to determine, has a role to play in determining whether such a proposition is thereby true or false, okay? So in other words, the upshot is that the concept of being a bachelor in the framework that we've built uh, does not represent, and the predicate bachelor in the framework that we've built is another merely expressive device, okay? You could say that expresses a concept, that's what it does, but it does not represent the property out there in the world. It does not reach into the labeling structure. And now you might say, well, Hannes, sure, but that's another strange framework that, it, that you've built. Okay, why would you do that? But I want to say, no, that's actually, a, I hope, a nice, simple framework that I've built. It's actually a good model theoretic reconstruction of how we generally think stipulative definitions work semantically. Okay? So the tra tradition would have said stipulative definitions are true by convention, okay? They are not made true by the facts, but by the conventions that you set up. And here, this means they, the sentence like for all X, X is a bachelor just in case X is an unmarried man, that is true just in virtue of mathematics and the way I defined the framework, okay? And that's different from, you know, there is a bachelor, that would be true, in virtue of, you know, something in the world out there, okay? What the facts are like, okay? So in our little toy example, there is a bachelor was actually false because the only um, man out there was Adam and he was married, okay? But the falsity of there is a bachelor, that's not just true in virtue of mathematics and the framework, but also in, in virtue of the labeling, okay? But uh, for all X, X is a bachelor just in case X is an unmarried man, that is just true in virtue of the framework and mathematics, okay? Um, and that's 
because the predicate bachelor was ultimately in that framework stipulatively defined. Okay? The meaning of bachelor in the framework is ultimately given by the meanings of married and man. Okay? The predicate bachelor does therefore not itself contribute to truth conditions for propositions. Whereas the primitive predicates, as it were, married and man, they are not merely expressive devices. Okay? They represent concepts, and the concept represents something in the world. More generally, you can define in the framework a sentence to be analytic in the framework, just in case the proposition it expresses is the set of all worlds in the framework. And since my frameworks will always be built to be such that the set of worlds in the framework is true just in virtue of maths and the way I define the framework, okay, this tracks the old idea of analytic sentences being true in virtue of sort of the meaning of the terms that are included in the sentence, okay? So for example, all the logical truths will end up being analytic in the framework that we've just built, as will be a sentence like, for all X, if X is a bachelor, then X is an unmarried man, or for all X, X is a bachelor if and only if X is an unmarried man, and so on. All of them will be analytic, and that's exactly how the tradition would have uh, conceived of these sentences anyway, okay? So I think that's a good and reasonable reconstruction of analyticity and also of stipulatively defined terms, and they end up as merely expressive devices in uh, frameworks like that. Okay? Now, there are other uh, um, applications of the same idea. Um, and, and, and think of this quotationalism about truth. Okay? This quotationalism about truth. Okay? Uh, which has a background in Tarski and then, you know, got very important with, with Quine and then, you know, much more prominent uh, since at, at least the 1980s. Okay? Now, if you're a disputationalist, okay, or a certain kind of deflationist about truth, then you want to say that the role of the truth predicate in language is it helps us to express certain thoughts, okay, that you couldn't express otherwise, or that would be very hard to express without the truth predicate, okay? But then disputationalists would add that there is nothing like the truth property out there in the world that is waiting for us, you know, that has a kind of explanatory role to play in science or the like. Okay, so for this quotation list, the truth predicate is, in my terminology, a merely expressive device. And indeed, you can use the methodology that I've just given you. You can build a conceptual framework in which the truth predicate will end up uh, being a merely expressive device in my sense. Okay, and the way you would do it is you, you build up your, your conceptual frameworks, you add a language at each world you will have a Tarski and truth component, which will be a set of sentences or a set of Gödel codes of sentences, okay? So you have sentences or numbers representing sentences in the domain of the possible worlds, okay? And then the, this, this component, the Tarski and truth component at a world will be determined from the other components by means effectively of a Tarski and truth definition, okay? And then you define actuality. And at that point, when you define actuality of worlds, and ultimately truth for propositions, you do not involve that truth component, okay? They don't figure in the truth condition for propositions or in the definition of actuality. And once you build a framework like that, the truth predicate will help you to express propositions. So that's the role it has. It helps you to grasp thoughts, like the discutationist wants to have it. But once it has done that, that's it, okay? It does not additionally represent the property out there in the world because the truth component will not be involved in the definitions of actuality and truth for propositions. So the truth predicate will be a merely expressive device in precisely the sense that I've described before. So I hope you can see now that you can use my methodology to make this quotationalism about truth a bit more precise semantically, okay? And that's something that I like, okay? Because I always wondered what do they mean? It doesn't express a property. Here, here is what, what, what it what it means, okay? Now, let me go to my third example, and that will be the last example in my talk, and then there will be some general reflections, okay? Um, so, I build a different framework now. Um, so, it will be something new, okay? Um, again, I start with purely mathematical structures, that's the possible worlds, but now the domain of my possible worlds will be fixed. It will be the set one, two, the set of the natural numbers one, two. Okay, so that's different from before. And my worlds will be quintuples, five tuples, tuples with five entries that look like this. There will be the set D, that's the set one, two. Then I will have the 
one and the two as special components. So this is a little bit like in model theory, right? Sometimes in, in models or interpretations, we have distinguished objects, right? Say you look at the model for, for analysis, for the calculus, for the real numbers, then you might want to view of the zero in the, net, in the real numbers and the one in the real numbers as sort of distinguished objects, and you put them into your model, into your interpretation. And that's the same idea here. In my models, my worlds, I think of both one and two as distinguished, and that's why I put them in there as the second and the third component. And then I have M. This is now a binary relation, as it were, an arbitrary binary relation um, um, on D, okay? So it could relate one to itself and one to two and two to one and two to two. Then it would be the full binary relation. Or it could just relate one to one, you know, and that's it or something like that, okay? And then I have C, the final component, and that's another relation, okay, on D. But here is my little assumption. That's the only assumption, really. It's an equivalence relation. It's reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. And indeed, it's a congruence relation with respect to M. Okay? So by congruence relation, I mean that, for example, if, N, if M relates two things, okay, X and Y, and X stands in a congruence relation to X prime, and Y stands in a congruence, congruence relation to Y prime, then X prime and Y prime will also stand in the M relation. Okay? Or you put it, to put it differently, assuming that C is a congruence relation means that from the viewpoint of a world, it's something like an identity or equality relation, okay? If at the world, two objects stand in the C relation, then for that world, these two objects are indistinguishable for the world, okay? They are like as if they were identical from the viewpoint of the world. That's what I mean by a congruence relation, Okay. And then I have a final component. That's again something new in my, my third example here. I will also throw in a, a relation not on D, but on the set of worlds. So this is the set of worlds, the set of all quintuples that I've just defined. And now I add a uniquely defined binary relation on worlds. I call it an accessibility relation. Okay. And I, I explicitly define it. If you take two worlds, W and W prime, then I say, W stands in the accessibility relation R to W prime, just in case, and here's the definition, their C relations, their identity or congruence relations are identical, okay? So they have sort of the same views with respect to identity. Then I say that, you know, W prime is uh, accessible from W, okay? Obviously, this again gives you an accessibility relation on the set of possible worlds. Okay, and why do I do that? Well, you know, I want to deal now with metaphysical necessity. That's my third example. So in intentional semantics, how would you deal with metaphysical necessity operators? Well, you would have a possible world semantics. So we want to have an accessibility relation by which ultimately we will be able to interpret necessity operators. And that's the accessibility re relation that I'm using, that I will be using in this, in this framework. Okay, that's why I, I throw it into the framework as well. Okay, but here's the important point. So far, all of that is purely mathematical again. We still live in this purely mathematical box. Okay, the only thing is I have now an accessibility relation on worlds, but you can see that this is not, not much of a change. It's purely mathematical and it won't cause any new trouble, as you will see. Okay, now what's the second thing that we need for the conceptual framework? Well, the labeling, right? The empirical labeling, as it were, the intended interpretation. The, the stuff that we want to think about or talk about. And this is my labeling now. So I, my first component will consist of a set of an entity MS and another entity ES, okay? And I also take these objects and put them here as my second and third component of the labeling structure, okay? What is MS? It's the last body to be seen in the sky before sunrise in the period between the beginning of the year to mid-March. And ES is the first body to be seen in the sky after sunset in the period between mid-August to the end of the year. Okay, so now you get an idea why I say MS and ES. MS is really the morning star and ES is really the evening star. And since we're all enlightened um, uh, astronomists, we also know that MS is identical to ES, is identical to Venus. So really, this is just a long-winded way of saying that, you know, what I put here is the singleton set consisting just of Venus, 
right? The morning star and the evening star, it's all the same. And I put Venus here and I put Venus there, okay? That's all. The only reason I write this up in the way is that even if you didn't know that morning star equals evening star equals Venus, if you didn't know that, you could still use the framework that I'm currently describing, that I'm currently defining and setting up, okay? Even an astronomist, you know, centuries back when they didn't know that Venus is identical to morning star is identical to evening star, they could have used the framework that I'm currently describing, okay? I do not build into uh, any astronomical facts as it were into my framework. That's why I'm highlighting it and describing it in the way that I do, okay? Now, the fourth component in my labeling structure, that's a particular movement pattern out there in the world that can be observed astronomically, okay? And it's the movement pattern of the morning star and the evening star. So, I define move pattern to be the set of all ordered pairs D and D prime of objects in the set morning star, evening star, such that the moon movement pattern is the one that you associate with morning star, evening star. Okay. So periodically there is a stage of appearance of D in the morning star, uh, in the morning sky without an appearance of D prime in the evening sky. And then this changes around, right? Um, there's an appearance of D prime in the evening sky without an appearance of D in the morning sky, and then, and so on, this oscillates, okay? If you have a movement pattern like that, that's the fourth component, okay? So we all know that Venus stands to itself in that movement pattern, right? Because when it appears in the morning sky, it doesn't appear in the evening sky, and then it changes and so on, okay? So we know what that movement pattern is, but even if you didn't know, there would be a well-defined set that you could put there, Okay? And then as the uh, next component, right, I just put in the identity relation on our set MS and ES. Okay, so the set of all ordered pair D prime, uh, D, D prime of objects in MS and ES, for which it is the case that D equals D prime. So this is just the set with the pair Venus, Venus. We know that. But even if you didn't know, you could put there the identity relation and that would be well defined. Okay. And then again, I have an asterisk here, a star. And this is just to remind us that there is this further component in the math part of the framework, namely the R relation, the accessibility relation. But here's the thing. We won't label it at all. It won't represent anything in the world. Okay. So this will be to do with the fact that in the framework that we're building, the metaphysical necessity operator will be a merely expressive device. Okay, and we're almost there. So don't think of the um, accessibility relation as representing anything out there. It's just there to help us structure our thoughts, okay? And the thoughts live in the purely mathematical part of the framework that we're building, okay? So put all these components together, W, the accessibility relation, and the labeling that I've just described, then you get a framework. And as you can see, Again, in philosophy, you're sort of forced to use certain example. In this case, it's a Frege example, right? The, the famous morning star, evening star example. And I wanted to build a framework that sort of tracks the Fregean ideas about morning star and evening star to show you how that would work in, 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 uh, in the way that I'm sketching, okay? Now, then you do what we did before. You define actuality for worlds, okay? Now, the only thing is things are slightly different because we have quintuples now, one, two count as distinguished objects. So I define W to be actual, just in case there is this labeling function from D to you know, the set consisting just of Venus, um, which is structure preserving and has these features here. So structure preserving now means one is mapped to morning star, two is mapped to evening star. So both are really mapped to Venus, right? And the M relation tracks the movement pattern of Venus and the congruence relation at the world tracks the actual identity relation that's out there. Okay, so the important point is that first, there is no R component here. Okay, so the accessibility relation does not figure anywhere in the truth conditions for propositions because it does not figure in the definition of actuality of worlds. Okay, and secondly, in this framework, it's easy to see there is actually just one actual world. So you get you don't get these distinct but isomorphic worlds. That's because, you know, the framework is built a bit differently, but that's fine for my purposes, okay? Um, now, here's the thing. I want to say again that this framework, too, does not impose any constraints on the label components, okay? By math alone and the way I set up the framework, at least one of the worlds in the framework must be true, must get the structure of the labeling right. And the reason is, again, with respect to M, I run through all the combinatorial possibilities, okay? 
So I'm cheating just a little bit. So basically, I'm assuming, you know, that, um, you know, D is again uh, uh, non-empty, uh, okay? Um, so I'm assuming that, you know, roughly speaking, there is something there that we can talk about when we talk about the morning star and the evening star. So this is a bit like in the previous framework. And secondly, I also presuppose, as it were, that the actual identity relation of things out there in the world is a congruence relation, has the formal properties of a congruence relation, of the C relation that I'm assuming in our possible worlds to be present. Okay. Um, so these are my provisors. Okay. But again, I, I, I dealt with, you know, non-emptiness before. Uh, think of classical logic with identity. Okay. We are happy to assume that the equality or identical symbols in classical logic has as logical laws you know, laws that basically express that the identity relation is a congruence relation, okay? So we are happy to have, you know, the substitutivity of identicals and that, you know, the identity symbol is an equivalence, uh, expresses an equivalence relation, all of that. We think of that as belonging to classical logic. That's the same presupposition that I'm building into my framework here, okay? So in that sense, I don't want to say that, you know, this is imposes a constraint on what the world is like, Okay. In the same sense as classical logic does not impose um, any particular way the empirical world is like, okay? As far as the M component is concerned, okay, the movement pattern, we run through all the combinatorial possibilities. Hence, however morning star and evening star move in the actual world, we must get it right by at least one world in the framework. At least one world in the framework must be actual, which means the set of all worlds in the framework must be true, just in virtue of mathematics and the way I built the framework. That's like in the previous examples, okay? So in this example now, um, there is just one actual world and it is this one, okay? Because we know morning star equals evening star equals Venus, okay? Um, so that's why you get the full relation to be the uh, congruence relation. And also uh, Venus, morning star, stands to itself, evening star, in the, in the movement pattern relation. So you get the full relation here as well. That's the actual world, okay? And there are other possible worlds in the framework that are not actual. And then you can look at propositions, for example, collect all worlds in which one and two stand in the movement pattern relation. That is, roughly speaking, all the worlds at which morning star and evening star instantiate the periodic movement pattern. If you collect all the worlds like that, you get a proposition. And that proposition is true in the framework. Why? Because it includes the actual world. Okay? Because here... This M component does include the pair one, two. Okay? So this is a set of worlds that is true. This is another proposition that is true. That's the proposition, roughly, that expresses that the morning star is identical to the evening star because it's the set of possible worlds in which the pair one, two stands in the C relation, is in this fifth component here. Okay? So these are worlds that think morning star equals evening star. That's a set of possible worlds that includes the actual world because actually morning star equals evening star equals Venus. Okay? So this is another proposition that is true. Here's another proposition. Take the set of all worlds W such that for all worlds W prime that can be accessed from W via R, via the accessibility relation, it holds that B, this proposition here, is true at W prime in the framework. Okay, so roughly speaking, you take B, that is this set here, you look at the worlds W prime at which B is true. These are the set W, this is the set of worlds W prime that are in B, that is, you know, the set of worlds W prime members of B. And then you consider all the worlds W such that whatever world W sees via R, it's in that set B. And if W is like that, right, all the accessible worlds from its viewpoint are in B, then say that W is a member of NB of that set, okay? Then basically what NB is, is it's a proposition that we would in natural language express by the sentence, it is necessary that morning star is identical to evening star. Because B says morning star is identical to evening star, and N, it's necessary that, that is usually interpreted by the accessibility relation, that's exactly what we do here. Okay, so we get another proposition here that's also true in the framework because it also includes W1 as is very easy to see. Okay, so these three propositions are all true in the framework because they all include W1 as a member. But here's the thing, none of these three propositions is identical to the set of all worlds in the framework. Okay, there's worlds in the framework that are not members of A or B or NB. Okay, so these propositions are true in the framework, but their truth 
is um, due to the framework and the facts. And, you know, that out there astronomically, morning star equals evening star, and that they, the movement pattern is the one of Venus and the like, okay? They are true, not just in virtue of the framework and math, but also in virtue of the empirical facts out there, okay? In contrast, okay, look at this set here. That's the set W without B, the complement of B with respect to W, okay? Um, um, oh, sorry, um, union NB. Okay, this is another set. You can prove that to be the set of all worlds in the framework. And I've already determined that the set of all worlds in the framework is true in the framework, just in virtue of mathematics and the way I set up the framework. Okay, so it's also true, but the facts don't play a role. Okay, the astronomical facts about Venus don't play any role here. Why do I look at this strange uh, uh, set here? Well, this is like not B, right? This is an or, and this is the necessity of B. So this is like not B or necessary B, okay? This is like a material implication of the form if B, then necessary B, okay? So you now see where I'm coming from. What this expresses ultimately is a kind of Kripkean proposition, a Kripkean law, okay? That we generally these days think um, uh, holds for metaphysical necessity, okay? And indeed, it, it does hold in my framework. So, you know, drive the point home, add language again, so we have a first order language, we have individual constants for morning star and evening star, predicates for the movement pattern and for identity. And now we also have a unary necessity operator, a sentential operator. And we interpret it as we standardly do in intentional semantics. In particular, we interpret the necessity operator by means of the accessibility relation R that we have in the framework. Okay, possible world semantics, nothing new. Then it follows that these three sentences are all true in the framework. The sentence that says morning star and evening star, they stand in this movement pattern relation, that's true. The sentence that says morning star equals evening star, that's true. And the sentence that it is necessary that morning star equals, e equals evening star, that's all true. Because the three sentences express the three propositions respectively that I referred to on my previous slide. And if you look at the sentence, if A equals B, if morning star equals evening star, then it is necessary that morning star equals e uh, evening star. Then this expresses the proposition that I just dealt with on the previous slide, really the set of all worlds in the framework. Okay, So this means the sentence expresses a proposition that is true in virtue of the framework alone in math. And by my previous definition, that is a sentence that is analytic in the framework. Okay, And that's one of these Kripkean laws that we nowadays think hold for metaphysical necessity operators like the box here, or hold in modal logic more generally for particular kinds, at least, of necessity operators, okay? So we all know that from possible world semantics, and here you have it. And it's a, it's a natural thought that this is analytic here, okay? So the upshot is, in the framework that I've built, the concept N for, you know, necessity does not represent, okay? It does not reach into the world. It's something that lives in the purely mathematical part. Okay, And the sentential operator, it is necessary there, the box operator, is a merely expressive device for the same reason. Okay, You could still say that it expresses a concept, let me the concept N as it were, but it does not represent a property out there in the world because um, the R relation that interprets it is not met to anything when we define actuality and truth. Okay. So it's the same idea as before. The metaphysical necessity operator box in this third framework is a merely expressive device. It helps us to think about the world, okay? But it doesn't do anything uh, beyond that, okay? Now, again, you might say, ah, but that's crazy framework. Why would you build that? It's not a crazy framework. I want to say it's a good model theoretic reconstruction of how we think model theoretic operators work semantically. Um, and in fact, what I do in this framework is I reconstruct something that Kripke would uh, uh, claim for natural language metaphysical necessity operators, okay, famously in naming a necessity. Um, so he, he, would, he, would, he would think, uh, you know, as you know, in the, in, in the book, he, well, what's behind it is a possible world semantics for the box operators. I do the same. And then he would claim that there are these statements in natural language that are not analytic, okay, that are uh, uh, metaphysically um, uh, necessary, Okay, and they are a posteriori. Okay, um, and you know the identity of morning star and evening star, or the necessity of that identity, would be examples of these kinds of formulas, and that's exactly what I do in the framework. 
Okay, so I get exactly the, the same result. You might think, ah, okay, what Hannes does is he repeats the old mistake of the logical empiricists, right? He identifies metaphysical necessity, what is expressed by the box, with analyticity, but it's not what's going on in the framework. It's a Kripkean framework, okay? So the box operator in this third framework does not express analyticity. And you can see that in my example. So box morning star equals evening star was true in the framework. We've already determined that, okay? But um, A equals B is not analytic in the framework. A equals B does not express the set of all possible worlds in the framework, okay? So necessary A equals B is true, but not because A equals B is analytic. So this means the box operator can't express analyticity, okay? Rather, what's going on is the facts determine which world in the framework counts as actual, Okay, the empirical astronomical facts about Venus determine that. And once that is determined, once you're, say, here, you look at all the accessible worlds from the actual world, you check, okay, whether the sentence A equals B is also true there. And if this is the case, then box A equals B is true at the actual world, okay? That's how we get that box A equals B is true at the actual world, okay? And henceforth, Truth, okay? But, you know, that sentence doesn't express the proposition that, that is the set of all worlds in the framework, okay? So metaphysical necessity is distinguished from analyticity, okay? Metaphysical necessity can still come out as true in the framework, okay? Um, you just look at those worlds that are metaphysically possible that the actual world sees, okay? Now, what about the a posteriori part that also Kripke defends, where you can add subjective probabilities over that third framework. And then you can also ju justify the Kripkean claim or rationally reconstruct the Kripkean claim that the belief in morning star equals evening star being necessary is a posteriori, okay? So if you want to see that, ask me again in the, in the uh, questions and answers period. I can tell you more about that. It's just that, you know, a posteriority wasn't the focus of my talk here, okay? But with respect to necessity, metaphysical necessity, you get exactly what Kripke wanted to have. Okay, and the metaphysical necessity operator ends up being a merely expressive device. So having being a Kripkean about metaphysical necessity and thinking that metaphysical necessity is merely expressive is perfectly compatible, as I want to show in, in this framework. Okay, and you can use the same idea to reconstruct um, something else that you might be interested in. Okay, so say you are an instrumentalist about theoretical terms in science. You are an instrumentalist about theoretical terms in science. Okay, I don't say you need to be. That's not on my agenda. Okay, but you could think that maybe the predicate electron in physics, okay, has just the function to help us think about, you know, what is observable in the world but doesn't otherwise reach into the world, okay? It's just an, Im an instrument that helps us to think about the observable part of our theories, okay? So then you're an instrumentalist about the theoretical term being an electron. This is a famous old position, okay? Um, it's no longer so popular as it once was. I'm only saying if you want to make precise what that position amounts to, use my methodology, Okay, just throw in the right object language, build the right framework. In that framework, the predicate X is an electron will be a merely expressive device. Okay, it helps us to grasp the thought, but you know, don't give it a component in a possible world that is mapped to something in the world. Okay, then it will end up being a merely expressive device. And hence, it's a mere instrument to have thoughts about, you know, the stuff that is, uh, um, yeah, that is really in the labeling structure. Okay. So in the frameworks that you can build like that, theoretical terms will only help us to express propositions without these terms representing properties or relations that are out there in the world, okay? So you can use the same idea to rationally reconstruct what is meant with instrumentalism about theoretical terms in science in very traditional uh, philosophy of science, okay? So that's it. Let me, let me draw some general conclusions now, okay? And then I'm, then I'm done. Um, so I've constructed three frameworks for merely expressive linguistic devices, okay? All of these frameworks are rational reconstructions of existing patterns of thoughts and language, okay? By that, I mean that the properties of my framework are reasonably similar to thought and language prior to reconstruction, okay? So in the, in the case with the logical operators, we were tracking that they are sync category, sync category items, okay? In the case of the 
um, uh, stipulatively defined terms, which are merely expressive. We were, we were tracking the idea that there are truths by convention, okay? And in the third part, this is new, okay? Even metaphysical necessity operators turned out to be merely expressive devices, and yet we could still track the Kripkean faults about metaphysical necessity, okay? In all of the cases, I hope the frameworks clarified, precisified, made more precise, and systematized this pre-theoretic thought and language. And that's exactly that role that famously Rudolf Carnap assigned to the linguistic frameworks that he built in his, you know, philosophy of science, philosophy of logic and, and the like, okay? So you can see the old uh, Carnapian idea that one of the tools that we should use in philosophy is to build, I say, conceptual frameworks. He said linguistic frameworks. My conceptual frameworks are basically further developments of Rudolf Carnap's linguistic frameworks, okay? In each framework, the total underlying set of worlds is a purely mathematical um, construction and is true by math alone and the way I defined the framework. No empirical evidence was ever required to support the truth okay, of the set of all worlds in the framework. Okay? This, uh, this is very much like Carnap arguing famously in this famous article, Empiricism, Semantics and Ontology, that the choice of a framework is purely pragmatic. Okay? There is no ep epistemic truth-related considerations necessary. Okay? And that's exactly the case with my frameworks. If I needed empirical evidence to argue for the truth of the world's set of worlds in the framework, then this wouldn't be conceptual frameworks, but just scientific theories. But they are not. Okay? My framework are purely conceptual, not theories. Okay? The theories would correspond to sets of worlds in a framework where the set of worlds is not identical to the set of all worlds in the framework where the set of worlds imposes some constraints on the empirical world, okay? But that's not the case with my, with my set of possible worlds whatsoever in the framework, okay? And in each of the examples, the merely expressive devices were useful, practically useful, okay? They helped us to express propositions um, that we couldn't maybe otherwise express, or at the very least, they helped us to express propositions uh, you know, in a way that is more convenient for us, okay? So maybe we could have expressed propositions without them, but it's much simpler to express these propositions to grasp these thoughts by using these uh, merely expressive devices, okay? So that's the general upshot, okay? Now for the q and I've prepared some additional notes and we'll see whether they're useful or not, okay? Um, just to give you the, the, the basic idea, um, I've done this for the OR symbol, Okay, in my first example, but actually you can do it also for disjunction, not in classical logic, but in intuitionistic logic. There is a whole variety of conceptual frameworks available that would work for logics that differ from classical logic. Okay, so with this picture, you can be tolerant, right? There is a pluralism about logic, and for each of these logics, you will have um, uh, logical frameworks that the framework choice, okay, will be purely pragmatic will be purely pragmatic because the set of worlds in each of the frameworks, even the one for intuitionistic logic and so on, the set of worlds in each of the framework, um, these sets of worlds will always be true by math alone and by the way we designed the framework. Okay, So these days, it's, uh, it's often the case that people say that logic choice is much like theory choice in science. Okay, It's a kind of inference to the best explanation. Timothy Williamson argues like that and so on. And I want to say there's something right and there's something wrong about that. Okay, As far as inference to the best explanation concerns uh, pragmatic virtues, I think they are right. Okay, But where they think inference to the best explanation goes beyond the pragmatic virtues, where they think there's a natural phenomenon out there in the world that logic explains, I think they're wrong, because the logical operators do not reach into the world, because they are merely expressive devices, at least in the frameworks that I built here. Okay, So I think you can learn something about the philosophy of logic in that way. With the second example, I hope I've shown you that analyticity in this framework is perfectly well defined. Okay, so there's nothing vague or problematic or circular or so like that. Okay, so many of Quine's attack on Carnap on analyticity, I think, were a bit misdirected. Okay, so I think Quine was right as far as analyticity for natural languages is concerned. There, it's very unclear what analyticity is meant to be, how to define it properly. Okay, but Carnap was interested mainly in analyticity for constructed, for artificial languages, for conceptual frameworks that you construct in the way that I've done it. Okay, and for them, analyticity can be defined in a perfectly precise way. And you know, the bachelor example was just one of them. Okay, um, basically, what the analytic statements are tracking is 
how information is structured, is packaged, is organized in the framework. And this changes from one framework to the next, okay? So this sentence here was true in the framework that I was building. It's analytic in the framework. But in a different framework, it might not be analytic because their information is um, 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 organized in a different way. Okay, so I don't think even if you look at the modern literature of analyticity problems with the traditional notion, Bogosian, they all think what what does that even mean? Okay, to fix um, um, the truth of a sentence exclusively by the meaning of the sentence, not by the facts. Well, I hope I've given you a story that makes that precise in the way that I've explained. Okay. And finally, in the third example, I've reconstructed descriptive thoughts, okay? And still the metaphysical necessity operator was merely expressive, okay? And I, I've, I've done the same, that is part of my book project, for all the other examples that Kripke had, okay? Naming a necessity, okay? C being a daughter of D, water being H2O, tigers are mammals. All of them will be metaphysically necessary, okay? statements true at the actual world, okay? But all of them will be a posteriori and so on and so forth, okay? And this also gives you an idea of how to think of metaphysics from my point of view. So metaphysics, in my point of view, deals heavily with merely expressive devices, like the metaphysical necessity operator. So then metaphysics is really something, a part of philosophy that constructs and studies different kinds of conceptual frameworks and recommends you to speak from within them, to think about the world from within them. That's metaphysics. It's about designing and applying conceptual frameworks. Okay. But all of that is consistent with the idea that metaphysical accessibility relations are not there, out there in the world, but are part of our constructions, as it were. Okay. So metaphysics is something that we construct, not anything that we discover out there in the world. Okay. So that's the new story about metaphysics. Okay. Um, and maybe there are further applications like that, okay? So maybe the counterfactual, if then the Timothy Williamson sort of is very fond of, that's so important in metaphysics of today, you can also think of the counterfactual, if then operator as a merely expressive device. Maybe mathematical symbols can be viewed as merely expressive devices, okay? So then the only role that mathematics has is it structures our thoughts about the world, but you don't find mathematics out there in the world that it's waiting for us to be discovered and explored, okay? So if so, then this would be a kind of logicism about mathematics. Mathematics merely structure thought, but doesn't impose constraints on the world out there. Okay? And if you take the whole package together, I hope it shows that some of the tenets of good old Canapian logical empiricism can be vindicated, at least to the extent to which uh, these old tenets were dealing with merely expressive devices. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Hannes. Uh, late game. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, very organized. Very clear. Uh, yeah, technically way. It seems to me you try to revive some key ideas from Canop. <laughs> Canop. Uh, so, uh, quite interesting. But uh, right now, I don't say the question from the audience. Um, maybe I take the advantage of the chair of your lecture. I ask two questions. Uh, first, you say uh, many words, uh, including logical uh, constant, just express so, some uh it's play uh just play ling linguistic rule not the contra contribution to the truth conditions of the relevant uh, proposition but how do you think you say extension uh levity says it says the truth value of compound uh, propositions is determined by two different elements. One, uh, the elements from the world. Uh, the, the next, the, the structure. The structure. Uh, for example, conjunction, disjunction, implication. So, the, 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 the 
logical consistent. Indeed, they have their contribution to the truth value of the compound proposition. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, don't consider considering uh, logical con logical consistence. We cannot tell the the, the truth value of a uh, compound uh, proposition and quantification uh, uh, proposition. What do you think? This is my first question. The second, you see. The, the, the logical proposition just uh, present structure, don't present some properties out there in the world. But uh, you know, uh, Glacier recently developed develops the substantive theory of truth. He want to, she want to grounded logic. In the world and also in the mind, in her in her view, point that the logical uh, constant, uh, the structure, the structure elements, indeed grounded in the world. Uh, she says, uh, uh, in the world, they are individual. Uh, property, relation, and also their classes, can, the, the uh, sex, uh, property, uh, objects have their material properties, like be a man, be married, something like that, but also they have formal properties. Uh, defined uh, on the sex. For example, uh, union, in section, inclusion, something like that. So, in that sense, logical, have a logical consistent, have uh, presented formal properties of the Objects in the world. Uh, this is my uh, two questions. What is your response? Okay, uh, thank excellent, you. Excellent, excellent. So about the first one. Um, so the idea is really this, right? You have a sentence. So you mentioned, you said sometimes structured proposition. They structure propositions, but really, what's structured by the logical operators in some sense is the sentence, right? You have yeah. A or B, right? Yeah. My propositions are just sets of words. So the propositions themselves are always unstructured. But the sentences are structured, right? You have A or B in this, in this, in this order and so on, okay? Um, then you apply the semantic rules. And these are just the semantic rules, right? Um, you do it in the usual way. And by working through the semantic rules, you, you ultimately get to the atomic formulas. And in this pro process, the logical operators had a role to play, right? They, they help you determine the, the proposition that is expressed by A or B from the proposition that is expressed by A and the proposition that is expressed by B, okay? And say A, B are atomic, then the process stops there, okay? And that's the point where you then look at, if you're at a world, what, you know, what the components are in the world. And it's these components of the world that are then mapped to stuff out there in the real world in order to determine whether these atomic formulas ultimately express something that's true or false, okay? But in this final part, the truth function that is associated with this junction symbol didn't play a role anymore, okay? So the logical symbols like this junction, they play a role for the complex sentences and help us to determine the proposition that is expressed by them from the proposition that is expressed by the atomic formulas, right? And that's the, that's the only thing that it, is, that it does, okay? And then to determine which propositions are expressed by the atomic formulas, we look at, you know, um, the components in the world that belong to the atomic formulas. And then you then want to see whether you have the proposition that is determined now, whether you have a proposition that's true, then you look at how they are labeled in my frameworks, okay? And it's this final part that is only done 
for the components in the world that are labeled, okay? And linguistically, for the atomic stuff, the, the primitive predicates, right? Like man or married, that have components associated with them that are labeled. But this final part is not what's happening with this junction symbol, okay? And that's why the disjunction symbol is merely expressive, whereas the atomic predicates, if they are primitive, okay, uh, they are not merely expressive, okay? In my second example, I also had a predicate, not a logical operator, a predicate, namely the predicate of being a bachelor, that was also a merely expressive device, okay? So you, uh, it helps us to determine a set of worlds for each sentence, but when you then want to determine whether that set of worlds is true or false, the bachelor predicate wasn't associated with any component. And that made the bachelor predicate also a merely expressive device, okay? So it's not for all predicates that you get the result that they are merely expressive. For primitive predicates, as it were, okay? You get that they are merely expressive, but for defined predicates, like in the second, the second framework, they are not merely expressive, okay? So bachelor has something in common with the operator, okay? They're both merely expressive devices. Even though the bachelor predicate also has something in common with being married and being a man, namely it has in common to be a, a predicate, okay? But that's, that's how it works. I hope that clarifies the picture, okay? And with respect to the second question, I think that's a very good question. So there are philosophers of logic out there, like Guy Lachère and others, right? Who would think, who would say to the me, oh, many. Yeah, many. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yes, many, many, yeah. Um, probably also Tim Williamson, if you ask him about it. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, they would say, I agree with you, Hannes, that logic is about structure as it were. Okay. It's just that they would locate that structure in the world. Whereas I sort of locate the structure in the conceptual framework. Okay. And now here's the question. So how do you even distinguish between the one case or the other? Okay. Now the argument, I think, in favor of my position is the following. You can also structure propositions or sentences differently. For example, say you are an intuitionist. You're not a classical logician. You're an intuitionist. Okay. And say you do physics, but based on intuitionistic logic and intuitionistic mathematics. That's possible. In my view, what happens is, you just structure thoughts differently. And, and then with these differently structured thoughts, you, you think about, you know, electrons and what's out there in the world. Okay. Whereas they, Guy Lachère and Tim Williamson, and, you know, sort of with this more naturalistic take on, on, on logic, they would have to say that the world out there is at the same time classical and intuitionistic and paraconsistent. And that almost sounds like a contradiction. Okay, so it becomes hard to locate the structure in the world. But if you locate it in the way in which we conceive of the world, there is no reason why we shouldn't be able to think about one and the same world in different ways, which you then reconstruct at diff as, as different frameworks. Okay, so for me, classical logic, intuitionistic logic, it's not the case that one is true and the other one is false. They just happen to structure thoughts about the world differently. And one way of structuring them can be more useful practically for some purpose and less useful for another. And maybe for other purposes, it is the, the other way around. So I think there is this advantage that I have. It's compatible with a pluralism, a tolerance about logic. Whereas the other position is very hard to reconcile with a proper pluralism. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Excellent question. Uh, uh... Sun Zhong Yang forward some question to me or to Hannes. Maybe Chen Rong ask a question. Chen Rong, yeah. Okay, uh, thank Hannes for this very insightful and uh, uh, wonderful lecture. Yeah, I have thank two you. questions. Yeah. Uh, the first one is about uh, concept, uh, concept framework. He said that uh, uh, the concept world, uh, uh, concept framework you give in the lecture is designed uh, uh, for the analysis of uh, semantic for some specific uh, natural language. Yeah, what I'm wondering is that uh, uh, do we have some classification of mineral uh, expressive devices and uh, then we uh, design a concept framework for this different kind of 
uh, minimally expressive devices. Yeah, I, I'll just say that some general uh, general uh, definition for the uh, or general framework, general analysis of uh, concept <laughs> framework. Uh, not not not. Uh, so, uh, not 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 uh, uh, just uh, for the specific uh, uh, analysis for some natural language. Yeah. Y yes, I think you, you, you can do that more generally, okay? So, first of all, um, I, I don't want, strictly speaking, call what I do uh, an analysis. I prefer the term rational reconstruction of natural language. And the difference is, okay, uh, with the re rational reconstruction, you are sort of allowed to change things, okay? So, for example, think of the material implication symbol, okay? I would say it's, it's a merely expressive device, okay? And it's a good rational reconstruction of if-then in mathematics, okay? Um, I'm not sure it's a good analysis, though, because the if-then in the language of mathematicians um, is probably not quite a material implication, right? It still has, you know, something that's, that has different features, okay? It's not just a truth function. It's more complicated, okay? So, but still, you know, the material implication symbol is similar enough to the if-then in mathematical practice to be useful as a rational reconstruction. And it also changes things a little bit. It simplifies things. It idealizes things. Okay. Um, that's what my conceptual frameworks are meant to be. Okay. They are rational reconstructions, sort of precisifications, systematizations, making things more consistent. But you start with a pattern that's out there. You try to be similar to the pattern in the framework, but you don't have to be identical to what's out there, okay? So certain facts about the if-then in natural language are, of course, not matched by the material conditional in classical logic. That's fine, because it's just a rational reconstruction, okay? It's just similar enough, doesn't have to be uh, identical, okay? So that's what I want to say. It's not so much an analysis of rational reconstruction or explication. That's another term that Carnap would have used for that, okay? You make things a bit more precise, and you're allowed to, to sort of to change the pattern that's out there, to improve the pattern that's out there. Okay, so that ultimately that's the methodology. That's what my conceptual frameworks um, um, are used for. And about the other part, um, in the book, I will also give a definition, a general definition of blah, blah is a merely expressive device in framework, blah, blah. Okay, that will be a general notion. And examples will be the logical operator, you know, the OR operator in my first framework, the, the predicate bachelor in the second framework, and, you know, the metaphysical necessity operator in the third framework, okay? So then you have a general notion that you can apply to fragments of natural language, to fragments of the language of mathematics, to fragments of the language of science, and to fragments of the language of philosophy as we now use it, okay? So pretty much to, to everything, including even um, ethics and, um, and moral philosophy, okay? So another interesting example that I have in mind is I want to say that the moral ought operator, it ought to be the case that, or it is permitted that, it is forbidden that, okay? Operators that we use in ethics, okay? That they are merely expressive devices too, okay? And by that I get sort of that moral statements will have truth values, they will be true or false, they express propositions, but they don't reach into the world as it were. They still have a merely expressive function. Okay, and by that I marry good old expressivism about moral terms that you find in logical empiricism with the thought that moral statements can still be true or false and express propositions. Okay, as you have it in modern sort of disputationist or deflationary uh, theories about uh, um, um, moral expressions. Okay, so that, that's another example. It's a very broad picture that I will paint in the book, but I couldn't paint today uh, in my talk. I hope that that helped a little bit with what you had in mind. Okay. <laughs> uh, maybe I can. Uh, I, I ask a lot of question. Mm. I myself have a difficulty to catch the meaning of met metaphysical necessity. Uh, the, 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 I think it is not well defined. Uh, uh, I can understand what is logical necessity. Semantic necessity, but I, I, I have a real difficulty to understand what is 
necessity, uh, metaphysical necessity. You know, maybe you know. Uh, I think some 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 people shared my feeling. Uh, for example, Bamet has a doubt uh, with the conception, and also um, uh, pr uh, pre pressed. Recently published a book, uh, book about uh, uh, an actor to challenge the concept of metaphysical necessity. Originally, uh, uh, he, he agreed, he sympathetic to the concept of metaphysical necessity, but he has some question. He changed he, his ideas. Uh, could you explain something about metaphysical necessity? Yes. Okay. So I share all the worries that you mentioned. So we are very close, Chenbo. Okay, we are very close. Okay. I also have deep worries about metaphysical necessity. Okay. Uh -huh. um, you you didn't mention Quine, right? He would be another person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deep worries oh, about of course. Uh, right? And you didn't mention the logical empiricists because they also had deep worries about metaphysical necessity. Okay? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm with all of them. Uh, uh, but that's, I hope, what will make my story, my theory, my account attractive to people who are worried, okay? Uh, because um, if you worry, I just build a framework for you in which I get all the truth values right that Kripke wanted to have, Yeah. okay? So I get everything that he had, but there is nothing unclear or imprecise about what he had in mind, because I can give you my precisely defined framework. And if you say, Hannes, I, I don't know what metaphysical necessity is, then I will just say, well, Chenbo, I mean that what I have reconstructed in the framework. Look at it, right? And then you see the purely mathematical parts and the empirical parts, how they interact, how you get the truth values. And you will say, okay, Hannes, now I understand metaphysical necessity. If that's what you mean by it, I'm fine, okay? And that will be my story, okay? <laughs> okay. And I want to say... As long as metaphysics can be reconstructed in a framework like that, I know what it is about and how it works. Okay? Uh, uh, if there are parts of metaphysics that can't be re reconstructed like that, sort of by principle, then I would again say, well, maybe there is something deeply problematic about that part of metaphysics. And I would put that as a challenge to the metaphysicians and say, to be honest with you, I don't understand that part because I can't reconstruct it in a framework. I've done my best, I failed. Can you help me? I don't understand it, okay? So I will then put back the challenge, and if they say, yeah, we can't do it either, then I will just say, well, for the moment, I can't work with that. Maybe that's a part of metaphysics that for the time being, as long as we can't reconstruct it, we should forget about. Maybe later, who knows, okay? But <laughs> in the parts that I can reconstruct, I can work with them, and they become useful. Okay, and here's an example. There's an example that actually Tim Williamson sometimes uses, but I use it for different purposes. Okay, so he would say something like this. So I'm, I'm currently sitting here in my office. Okay, and I have, I have a printer next to me. You can't see it, but it's there. And actually, the printer is reachable from me. Okay, I can reach it. So the apple and the can, that's a modality. It's not quite metaphysical possibility, but you know, it's not that far away either. Okay. So I've expressed the proposition, I've told you something interesting and non-trivial about my office, namely that where I'm sitting in my office, the printer is reachable from me, I can reach it, okay? So I've used the modality to say something interesting about the world, okay? Now what I'm doing is I could reconstruct that in one of my frameworks with a possibility operator, okay? So you get, so the sentence, it is possible for Hannes to reach the framework, will get, you know, the truth value true, and you will see what proposition it expresses, you will understand it, okay? But when I'm done with my reconstruction, you don't need to assume anything in the world like, you know, an, um, an ability, accessibility relation that's out there in the world waiting for you to discover it, that, you know, that you don't need to think that there is a metaphysical structure in the world, okay? That physics is tracking. You just need to assume what physics is assuming, what science is assuming. That's the thing that you say is in the world. There's the printer, it has a certain distance from me, you know, all of these facts, that's facts, okay? But then you have a way of, a simple way of thinking about the world in terms of ability to reach, can reach. It helps you to think about the physical world, okay? You don't need to assume that there is a primitive ability relation built into the world. That's just physics out there. 
But in the way you grasp thoughts about that physical world, my office and so on, the distance of the printer from me and so on, there is something that helps you to, to grasp thoughts about that. And that's the concept of reachability. And that's a term reachable that you have in natural language. It just helps you to think about the world. Okay. And that's what it does. Reach ability, the Apple part of it, that's a merely expressive device, I want to say. Okay. So that's how I think of metaphysical possibility or necessity in general. It's just a way that for some reason humans came up with in the development of language and of thought in our culture, right? In history, where we, where we have found a simple way to think about the complex world. Okay. But in some sense, it's the way of how we conceive of the world. That's where you find it. It's a way of structuring the world, okay? You don't need to worry that the world itself all of a sudden becomes metaphysical over and above what science tells us the world is like, okay? That is, I think it's compatible, I think, with a Quinean picture, okay? It's compatible with a Carnapian logical empiricist picture, okay? Um, uh, and you can still do metaphysics. Of course, it changes what you think metaphysics is like, okay? Not every metaphysician will like it, but to be honest, some metaphysicians actually like it a lot. So um, there are papers out there um, uh, who argue that, that, that metaphysics is a kind of modeling of the world, okay? Um, uh, so, so that's roughly my picture too. And it's just that I say, and it's not more than that, okay? Okay, thank you. Um, Maybe I ask a last question. Yes. Very uh, the, 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 uh, Kripke proves that, uh, if, uh, A equals B implies necessary, necessary, it is necessary that A equals B. But some people, including me, uh, have a challenge to this proof. Uh, in this proof, Hey, 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 regard the necessary as a property, as a predicate uh, of an uh, individual. But I think that's a proper, proper, problematic. Uh, uh, also, I think John Burgess wrote a paper uh challenge this uh proof uh, you cannot prove uh, the, the, the if a equals b the the, the predicate past uh, reinforce the first order property of the object like a uh, uh, be clever and uh, be married be a man be a genius, uh, but you can't put in uh, uh, being necessary. Uh, if you're being necessary, any uh, predicate can put into this place. The why not a, be a pre-arrive put into this price? Uh, what do you think? Yes, I, I think that's right. So the way I think of the situation is this, okay? So yes. Kripke didn't talk about frameworks, right? He was talking about natural language and so on. The yes. way I do it, and I reconstruct what he had, and I get A equals B implies it's necessary that A equals B, but that's because I built the framework like that, okay? Now, if someone says, look, I want to use a framework where you can't prove that, then that's fine for me. That will be a different framework, Okay, as long as it can be made precise in the way that I sketch, I'm perfectly happy with that. So basically change around uh, modal logic, okay, or say that this is a kind of rigidity axiom, right? The identity relation is rigid in a sense, okay? That's what A equals B implies necessary A equals B expresses. Some terms will be rigid like that, other terms will not be, okay? You, you, you tell me what you want and I build a framework that will make the terms that you like to be rigid, rigid, and the others not, okay? So once we have all these frameworks there, the next question is, which of these frameworks is more useful as a rational reconstruction of patterns that we find in natural language? And which of them is more useful to be used in metaphysics, say, okay? And then we have to study a little bit natural language, natural language intuitions, as people would say, okay? And I think Kripke track that the way we use natural language is, is, is quite close to what he has in mind, okay? 
So he had a good feeling for that. So that's why I think these Kripkean frameworks will be very useful for reconstructions of natural language and maybe more useful than the non-Kripkean frameworks, okay? Now, the question, which of them are more useful to do metaphysics? Well, I think that's an open question, right? Maybe there is a metaphysics out there where you don't want to have that A equals B implies it's necessary that A equals B, okay? Or where tigers are mammals is not necessary, okay? That's possible, but it's yet to be shown. So you have to build a framework, and then you have to show why it will pay off to use to do metaphysics in it. For the time being, current present-day metaphysics is very Kripkean, okay? And it seems it's a useful way to do metaphysics, and it can be done in the Kripkean framework that I build in the book, okay? But I'm not ready to the thought that sort of my, this Kripkean framework is absolutely true and the others are not. There is no sense like that. All of my frameworks have sets of possible worlds that are true in the framework, right? All of them don't impose any constraint on the world anyway, okay? There's merely pragmatic arguments for or against them. They have different pragmatic virtues, and that's all, okay? And, and uh, so that, that would be my, my uh, general response, okay? Okay, uh, there is a question. There's some question from yes. the audience in the yes, chat yes. room. Yes, chat, yes, I, I, chat board. But you read this? Yes, uh, I read it. Okay. Let me quickly address them, okay? Uh, I think we're at the end of the time, so I, I try to be very quick, okay? So they uh, just, they maybe, just maybe I read it out to all the audience. Then uh, you choose. Uh, yeah. You, 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 you decide, okay? You, uh, yeah. I, I can do that, Chen Bo. I can do that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So the, the, the first is just a remark that they like the talk and the way one can now define analyticity. So thank you. That's, uh, that's also something that I like. That's the first thing. Then the next thing is a question. I would, last to ask, I would like to ask why in a metaphysical frame you fixed globally the labeling, of, the labeling of one and two as morning star and evening star. This was just for the sake of the example. So basically, the thought is you have this astronomist, say, 19th century, okay? They don't know about morning star equals evening star equals Venus, but they have something in their mind by which they can refer to the morning star, and they have something in their mind by which they can refer to the evening star, and they can keep these two things conceptually separate, okay? So morning star, that's the thing that appears in the morning, and evening star, that appears in the evening, okay? And it's as yet open whether what they have in the mind refers to the same phenomenon out there or not, okay? So in my reconstruction, one is the one thing that is pointing to morning star, and two is the other thing that points to evening star, and whether they're identical or not, that I, I, I reconstruct with the C relation, okay? And I wanted to make sure that in my third example, I have a way of referring to Venus as the evening star, and I have a way of referring to uh, Venus as the morning star, and that's the role of one and two. And to assume that I have this available, I made, I fixed that one refers to mon morning star and one to evening star. Ultimately, both are identical to Venus and both refer to the same thing, but the definition of the framework didn't presuppose that. So it was just for the sake of the Fregian example, okay? Then the next thing is, was I suspect this was to simplify the definition that is right, uh, um, but it doesn't feel natural to me. That, that might be but, you know, think of it the way I just described it, right? There was something in the astronomist by which they could grasp morning star, and there's something by the, in the astronomist's mind by which they were grasping evening star. And, and these representations, that's my one and the two. That's all that I'm assuming, okay? The next thing is, with respect to conventionalism, is starting with a label including married and man objectively better in some sense than beginning with a label starting instead with bachelor? No. So you could say, you could have as a primitive, the bachelor predicate, and you could have a bachelor component and map that to bachelors. That would be a different framework. And then maybe you define man in terms of bachelor and other predicates, okay? Then man would be the merely expressive device and bachelor would not be merely expressive, okay? So it happens with all of these terms that I'm defining, they are framework relative. Okay, in a framework, something is a merely expressive device. In a different framework, it might not be. In a framework, a sentence is analytic, but the same sentence might not be analytic in a different framework. Okay, and the, the idea is this, okay? You open up a textbook, say, on the calculus, and you find the definition of a continuous function. 
Okay, and say the definition is in terms of epsilon delta, right? For every epsilon greater than zero, there's a delta greater than zero such that. This is the explicit definition of continuity, say, in the textbook. And then a couple of pages later in the book, the author typically proves that continuity in the defined sense is equivalent to continuity in the sense of preserving limits of rational valued sequences. Okay, so that's one textbook. Now you look at a different textbook of the calculus, and as it happens, I can give you examples, some textbooks do it the other way around. They define continuity in terms of preservation of limits of rational sequences, and then a couple of pages later, they have a theorem that states again the equivalence of continuity in that sense, equivalent to continuity in the sense of epsilon delta. Okay, So different textbooks organize at the same body of information, the analysis, calculus differently. In one, the epsilon delta definition is used, and in another, the limit preservation definition is used. And one might be useful for certain purposes, and the other might be more useful for other purposes. Okay, um, so that um, continuous functions satisfy the epsilon delta requirement will be analytical in the first textbook, but not in the second. Okay, and that's exactly like I do it in my frameworks. Okay, so my frameworks are just the same idea. You can um, organize information in different ways, like mathematicians organize one and the same body of knowledge in different ways. And if you think how important, how useful, how relevant definitions are in mathematics, you can see that what I'm doing with different frameworks is quite relevant, right? It's not arbitrary. It's pragmatically more useful for certain purposes and less useful for other purposes, okay? Um, um, okay, then this seems a metaphysical issue, possibly recalcitrant to a treatment in terms of merely expressive devices. I hope not. I hope what I've just explained um, helps you. Um, um, could a necessary truth a posteriori, um, like A implies necessary A, uh, be similarly constructed in your framework? Yes, it can. So you, you can do these things. You can do these things. Yeah. Um, so that's, um, you could build a framework where even A equals B implies necessary A equals B would not be analytic. It would not be logical law. The Kripkean law would not be logical. It would not be analytic. And you would still be able to justify it in an a posteriori way. Yeah? So you can build frameworks like that. It would not be a Kripkean framework. And the question is what it would be useful for. But in principle, that's doable. Yes. So these were the questions, I think. Uh, I think it's a time is up. Uh, uh, thank you for Professor Hannes, uh, the Gables lecture. Thanks all the audience to attend this lecture. Oh, uh, a lot. Oh, yeah. Thanks so much. <laughs> uh, uh, there will be a second lecture on what days I forgot. Uh, and we will, we, we will announce the information about the second lecture uh, in the lab walk. So welcome all the friends to attend the sec second lecture by Professor Ned Gable. Uh, thank you. Thank all of you, okay? Thanks so much. Thanks for having uh, me. Great discussion and I'll see you time. next week. Okay. See you next week. Yeah. Thanks yeah. so much.